Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Garner Ted Armstrong of Ambassador College with The World Tomorrow. In this series of programs, we will tell you something of the problems of the world today, how they will affect you and their solution in The World Tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Garner Ted Armstrong. What does springtime parades, new outfits, church going, sunrise services, and rabbits have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? When you look at all the paraphernalia accompanying Easter, you're a little bit bewildered. You see kids painting eggs, hiding eggs, pretending not to know where they are, and running out and finding them. You hear about the annual uh, egg rolling party, and that's not Chinese food. It's something you do on the White House lawn, where kids roll these eggs around. You go out and buy dozens of them, hard boil them. They have these little tinted packages. They have little faces and things. The kids get a fantastic amount of fun out of putting all these decorations on these eggs. I used to do that clandestinely. Hard boil the eggs, get some watercolors. Uh, there are all sorts of dyes. You can dye them blue and pink and red and, and uh, hop around for pretend you're a bunny, I guess, and lay them. Then when kids go and pick up in a field someday what they think was a bunny's egg, they get a surprise because they find out bunnies don't lay eggs, but it takes them a long time to discover this because when they're little tiny kids and they go in, they see little grass baskets. Oh, it's exciting to go to the five and dime. Do they have five and dime or are they dollar and two dollar stores? Anyhow, to go to the stores at that time of the year and they've got beautiful candy displays. I mean, chocolate bunnies and vanilla bunnies. <laughs> they want to be careful about racism there. They've got all kinds of bunnies of every color hue you can imagine. So everybody's represented. I hope they've got yellow bunnies and red bunnies. But they're all made of various candies. And there are tons of these little eggs. They're all the way down, little dinky things like this, up to big giant eggs that you can just take a bite of and they're kind of a sponge-like sugary candy. Isn't it a little bewildering, though, when you ask, what does a new Easter outfit, what's Easter? Is that the opposite of Western? Uh, what is a new Easter outfit and funny-looking eggs on your hat brim or rolling eggs around or hiding them in alleged little nests around the periphery of your house or your lawn or your garden somewhere and then having the kids go look for them and then give them a prize or let them eat the thing when they find it? What in the world has that got to do with a brutal murder that occurred way back about 1900 years ago in history when a man named Jesus Christ of Nazareth was taken out and beaten within an inch of his life, almost killed by a scourging and a beating, then forced to drag the stake through the streets of Jerusalem outside the gates into a place called Golgotha that is pictured on the uh, cover of this booklet that I want to tell you about, which is entitled The Resurrection is Not on Sunday, which is what I'm coming to, to give you a little bit of a preview of that right now. This is Golgotha, the place of the skull. And when you stand off and look, as I have done, at this very uh, promontory itself, right above an old smelly bus station outside the walls of the Damascus Gate of Jerusalem, you see that there is a rather skull-like appearance to the caves in that limestone bluff. Now, up on top, there is a graveyard, and right up there somewhere is where many people think Jesus Christ was crucified. But what do gorgeous hats and brand new outfits and, you know, matching clothes for father, mother, daughter have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, people about this time say, well, what's he getting uptight about? I mean, it's good to have a special commemorative occasion. It's good to go buy new clothes because we do it in commemoration of Jesus. Well, let's look at the Bible account about how Jesus told us to commemorate this and how in the very night that he was betrayed, he, uh, he did all these things. And we'll kind of read it the way it looks in the Christian religion today. Here's that scripture for you to take a look at. Because if we believe that Jesus and the early apostles kept Easter, we've got to... Uh, do something with this scripture. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. The apostle Paul is talking. And he's saying, I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Now, I hope your set is really in good tune. That, because I'm going to give you a little reading example here. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took an egg, and when he had given thanks, he colored it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my uh, body, which is painted or colored or whatever for you, this do every year in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took his bunny after he had supped. And he said, this bunny... Now, about that time, you noticed that I made a couple of mistakes there. This is what the Apostle Paul is telling Gentile people in the city of Corinth, which is about 400,000 people. 
And uh, it is a very pagan city. It's a city with temples dedicated to all sorts of vestal virgins, and they weren't really, and all these other people. Oh, no, that isn't it. I'm sorry. Uh, this was uh, Diana. Excuse me. I, I meant other uh, alleged virgins way back earlier. There were lots of them. But these were uh, pagan temples, and they had all sorts of pagan temple worship. And that even involved, believe it or not, various uh, prostitutions. And it involved pagan idolatries. It involved sex worship and rites. They had their own pretty uh, modern pornographic displays at that time, but that had to do with the deities that they worshipped. And they believed that these deities had very much human appetites. And they were dancing around heaven all day wearing gauze and uh, little bits and pieces of cloth that was kind of flying in the wind. And they had all sorts of orgies, these gods of theirs. Well, in that pagan city of Corinth, of about 400,000 population, the Apostle Paul was teaching and preaching to Gentile Christians. I'd like to make that point clear because most people who are not really acquainted with New Testament theology might think that I'm trying to tell you something about an Old Testament religion in this program and talking about Easter. They might think, well, now, wait a minute. He's going back to way before the times that we're commemorating today. No, that scripture you read, which we're going to read correctly now, was a scripture that it was a statement given orally as well as written from the Apostle Paul to Gentile Christians in the city of Corinth, and he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. So let's take a look at that scripture again, and we'll find out how to read it correctly, because I made a few mistakes with it the first time around. Now, I think we all know that no mainstream Christian churches actually try to say that Easter does come out of the Bible, that they can get the idea of bunnies or rabbits or any of these other accoutrements, from the Bible, but let's go back and read that scripture accurately now, what the Apostle Paul was saying to Gentile Christians in the city of Corinth. Here's what he said. The very same night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. It was bread, and it was just like the Passover observance, except instead of just eating the Paschal lamb, a lamb supper, he took some of the bread in his hand, and they used it, you know, to kind of dip up some of the juices and the meat with, and ate it that way, much the way we might do even today. And he broke this bread, like we might call it French-type bread, and symbolically gave small portions of it to these others, except it was unleavened bread. It was a flat kind of bread. It wasn't all puffed up like leavened bread is. It was unleavened. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat, handing it to his disciples, this is my body. Now, his body was right there, but obviously it was a representation, which is broken for you. It hadn't yet been beaten and broken, but it was about to be. This do, I remind you, this is in 1 Corinthians, in remembrance of me. Do you do that? After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new will, the new legacy, in my blood, this do you, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever, or as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's resurrection. Oops, there I go again. Keep getting these mistakes in there. Do you notice that? Uh, it says that when Christians eat this bread, Christians, yeah, that's right, Christians, eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Is this a ceremony that you see observed by most churches today? They take unleavened bread, break it, pass it among them, each one of them eats a portion of it, and then they drink a little tiny cup or a portion, a sip or so maybe, of wine, which is what he was pouring there into those goblets or cups, and uh, that they symbolize his broken body and his shed blood, and that they are commemorating his death. Well, we've got to answer, well, no, that's not what we see being done. We see the commemoration of his resurrection. Well, that's strange because the Bible doesn't show that we're to commemorate his resurrection. Now, I don't want to shock anybody, but I want to show you from the history as well as from the Bible that that's the truth. And that none of the various appurtenances to Easter that we know of today in the Western world with sunrise services and bunnies and eggs and so on have anything whatsoever to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ or with his death. That they are completely pagan. Now, this is a quotation from... One of the many books that I have right here on the desk with me, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, volume 8, page 828, and I quote, There is no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament or in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. 
And so Eusebius and Irenaeus and all these other apostolic fathers, even uh, the, the rest of the pre-Nicene or the anti-Nicene or the post-Nicene fathers, by the time you get on down several hundred years later, you can find a little bit about it, but in the apostolic fathers' writings of the Bible itself, you can't find it. It's a festival that is blended with paganism. This is from the Standard Dictionary of Folklore, Mythology, and Legend, pages 334, and I quote, Easter, the Christian festival commemorating the resurrection of Christ, synchronized with the Jewish Pesach and blended since the earliest days of Christianity with pagan European rites for the renewed season. Oh, then it's a springtime festival, the renewed season. In all countries, Easter falls on a Sunday after the first full moon on or following March 21st. It is preceded by a period of riotous vegetation rites, and by a period of abstinence, Lent, and by the special rites of Holy Week. Now that's funny because the Bible doesn't say a word about Lent. One time somebody thought that I was uh, making a mistake there, and they found that the word the past of tomorrow, like he lent me this or that, is indeed in the Bible. Of course it is, but the word Lent, this Lenten ceremony that some people observe, is not in the Bible whatsoever. I was in Düsseldorf, Germany one time. I went down into, uh, let's see, I was in Austria and also got up into Geneva area, or Zurich, at about this same period of time, and I was looking around wondering what on earth, and so I asked some of the local people, and here were human beings having their own kind of a form of Mardi Gras. As a matter of fact, Mardi Gras ties into the same thing. All over the world, whether in Gross Tuesday, which is what Mardi Gras means in New Orleans, or over in Düsseldorf, Germany, Geneva, Zurich in Switzerland, many cities in France, all over those countries, as a matter of fact, some of these pagan spring festival rites, meaning orgies, are still carried on. There is riotous feasting and eating and drinking, and mostly it's a complete drunken orgy. In many places now it has to do traditionally with wife swapping, with utter abandon, with absolute drunken orgies. And this all has to do with this pre-Lenten season. Mysteriously, it's hard to rationalize and say that this is a religious exercise. But I asked people on the street in Germany, as best I could, which isn't too well in English, but I was asking them with a German companion who could interpret, and so I made out all right there. So what is this you're doing? Here were people running around almost naked, dressed up like an American Indian, dressed up like anything, wearing costumes, and arm in arm, singing. There were bands in every square, and there were great huge fires that were lit at night and boiled away, you know, even on the rivers in Zurich and Switzerland. I remember they had them anchored on some of the bridges by cables, and they were out in the middle of the river that flowed through town. And here were these huge, big pyres of flame leaping and dancing and casting these eerie shadows against the walls. In each square, there was a different kind of a band. It might have been a rock band or German martial music or something else, and the people would dance around these fires and so on. So I asked, well, what is this you are doing? And they would say, oh, it's, it's for the children, or it's just this or that. But many of the people who were involved in it didn't really even know what it was. It's just a spring festival of some sort. So some of these historical sources are correct when they tell us that the Easter story is rooted and founded in rank paganism. Isn't Easter observed in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Christ? That's what most Christians believe. The answer is no, it is not. Centuries before Jesus, the springtime death and resurrection of a savior deity of some sort had become a favorite motif of popular paganism. This is a quote from a book called Easter, Its Story and Meaning by Alan W. Watt. From the literature of the ancient Sumerians in Mesopotamia comes the earliest legend of the death and resurrection of a pagan deity, the first Easter story. The death and resurrection motif spread to the deities of practically all ancient pagan Middle Eastern cultures. Now, in that same book, he said on page 58, and I quote, It would be tedious to describe in detail all that has been handed down to us about the various rites of Tammuz, who is mentioned in the Bible as a pagan god, Adonis, Cori, Dionysius, and many others. Some of them were celebrated at the vernal equinox, or thereabouts, and some at midsummer. But their universal theme, the drama of death and resurrection, makes them the forerunners of the Christian Easter, and thus the first Easter services long before there ever was a baby born in Bethlehem whose name was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
just because the name of Jesus Christ and the idea of Easter seem to be associated together in our modern world does not prove anything. It doesn't mean that the one represents the other or that the one has anything to do with the other. As a matter of fact, these historians are accurate when they say that the accompanying paraphernalia and all the rites and rituals, the pre-Lenten orgies, all the dancing and the bonfires and the ideas of rabbits and eggs which we're coming to had to do with purely pagan ritualistic experiences in commemoration of the beginning of spring or in the name of some pagan deity. They're correct on that. Now, that we today in modern America, Canada, and other countries associate the two together is no surprise. Because down through history, pagan peoples have continued to uh, use the very same symbols, the very same accompanying paraphernalia, the slogans, and the rituals that they always did. And when some of them were, quote, Christianized, the people who supposedly Christianized them let them keep many of these pagan ideas. We'll see what the Bible says about that a little bit later. John D. Davis, the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, page 145, one that I showed you, said this under the article Easter. Originally, the spring festival in honor of the Teutonic goddess of light and spring, known in Anglo-Saxon as Easter. E-A-S-T-R-E. -E. How about that? Did you know what the name Easter means? It's not the opposite of Wester. Does it come from the Bible? We'll show you in a moment that it does not. T.W. Sloan in Bible Myth, page 227, quote, The ancient pagan inhabitants of Europe celebrated annually this same feast, which is yet continued all over the Christian world. This festival began with a week's indulgence of all kinds of sports called the Carnivale, followed by a fast of 40 days. This was in honor of the Saxon goddess Osara, and there again you have this Easter, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, Aster, Astarte, Osara, or Esther, O E or E O rather, S T R E of the Germans, whence our English word Easter. Oh, then these historical authorities admit that our English word Easter doesn't even come from the Bible. Well, sure they do. There's no problem there. And certainly any of you preachers or any religious type that are listening to this program, and I think once in a while some might tune in. Please. Don't get bothered with me. Don't get upset about me trying to tell you what these historians say. I'll give you his name. Get real mad at T.W. Doan, who wrote that Bible myth book, or at John Davis, the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, and these other sources that I'm giving you, because this isn't my idea. I'm willing to go along with the broad majority of most of these historians when they tend to agree by the dozens on some of these things about where the word Easter came from. Now, Easter, spelled many different ways, E-O-S-T-R-E, Ostara, etc., was an ancient Germanic goddess of spring whose festival was kept at the spring equinox. This from Chambers Encyclopedia, Article Easter, and I quote, Many of the popular observances connected with Easter are clearly of pagan origin. The goddess of Stara, or Easter, seems to have been the personification of the morning, or east, and also of the opening year in spring. Now, Easter as a name entered the so-called Christian Sunday Resurrection Festival hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus Christ. It was only after the German Emperor Charlemagne in 800 A.D. had finally coerced the Saxons into the Catholic Church that the pagan festival of Easter, with all of its embellishments of eggs and bunnies, entered so-called Christianity, which it was not because there's nothing Christian about it if it isn't to do with Christ uh, at large. This article from the Encyclopedia Americana, volume 9, page 506, according to an early English historian and Catholic monk of the early 8th century, the word Easter is derived from the Norse Ostara, or Easter, however that's pronounced, meaning the festival of spring at the vernal equinox, March 21st, when nature is in resurrection after winter. Hence the rabbits, notable for their reproductive capacity. As a matter of fact, there are sex symbols, what they are. And eggs colored like rays of the returning sun, some of them with snakes around them, all sorts of various interesting things. Let me show you how the word Easter crept into the modern Bible. And you will see here, I'll come back next time to tell you a lot more about eggs and rabbits and some more of these quotations about the meaning of some of this type of thing. But first, let's find out what the Bible says about the word Easter. Acts 12 and verse 4 in the King James Version is the only place you can find the word Easter mentioned. But this was translated out of the Latin in 1611. You'll see there that it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him and sending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. The next that you will see, if you look very closely below the Greek figures there, this was written in Greek, it's translated 
Passover, and that's from the interlinear, the Greek interlinear with the English, and it's translated correctly, Passover. Next, a quotation from Strong's Concordance. And there is that word, Pasha, the very same word in Acts 12 and verse 4, of Chaldean or some other combined form, the Passover, the meal, the day, the festival, or the special sacrifices connected with it. So the correct translation, as attested by all other Bibles, with the exception of one or two that might want to perpetuate a completely pagan doctrine, is as you read here in verse 4. And having seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four quaternions of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to lead him out to the people. The correct word is Passover. It's Pasha. It's so translated in other versions. Matter of fact, take a look at the Spanish version sometimes, for those of you who speak the Spanish language. The word is Pasqua. It is never remotely translated Easter. And the Greek word Pasha or Pasqua has nothing whatsoever remotely to do with a pagan Germanic or Nordic word or a Babylonian word spelled O-E-S-T-R-E or A-S-H T-O-R-E-T-H or A-S-T-A-R-T-E, A-S-T-A-R-T-E, Aster, Oster, Oster, whatever they called this pagan deity idea in various different uh, countries. They had different spellings, but it was the same pagan idea. No, the word Easter is not found in the original Greek of your New Testament. It is nowhere in the Bible. Now, what you ought to do is to prove it to yourself. In a short, brief series of programs, I'm going to do it very thoroughly. I'll come back next time tell you about Easter eggs, Easter bunnies, all sorts of things, what they symbolize, really, and it's kind of a shock, really, because it's an ancient pagan sex rite, and we perpetuate it today. If you want to do it, that's your business. That's fine. I mean, anybody wants to keep Easter, let them have at it. But you ought to at least know what you're doing, don't you think? It ought to have deeper meaning to you that way. I mean, you could really find out what the bunnies are all about, and then you'd know. Write to these booklets on what the Bible really does say about Easter, and the resurrection was not on Sunday. The plain truth about Easter. Easter. Where does the name come from? Is it the opposite of Wester, or what is it? Why Easter? Do you know that that very same pronunciation was used in ancient Babylon, Greece, Rome, Egypt, and some of the Nordic countries of the Western world as civilization spread toward the New World? Did you know that ancient Germanic tribes, Druids, people of Mediterranean races, people in the Middle East, people in Babylon and down in Egypt, had customs that if you could be put into the proverbial time machine, like the alley-oop comic strip or something, except in this case you'd be going backward instead of forward. And you could be uh, plummeted backward in time, and you could get there right in the middle of, let's say, a baking uh, exercise, where the housewife in Egypt was in there at the, uh, probably they used a kind of adobe or fire brick kind of an oven, and she was just sliding these nice neat little buns in there. And when they came out, she had this nice kind of a substance to decorate them on the outside. You'd say, hey, look at that. I didn't know Egypt was Christian, because there would be a hot cross month. Or maybe if you were in ancient Babylon, and you were taking a ride around the walls, you just found yourself on the corner of the wall, you know, it could take about three chariots abreast with room to turn around there, and it was about 300 feet high, and there were two walls, a great big inner wall, the fabulous hanging gardens, there were fountains and there were all sorts of rivulets. A river actually went right through the main part of the city. It would have been a fabulous sight to see, but you also would have gotten there, let's say, about the time of, uh, of Easter. And you would have seen many interesting ceremonies. Here would have been all these people standing on this one side of the wall, see, where they could get a better view of the sun. And as the sun rose, you'd hear all kinds of enchantments and incantations, and people would cheer and applaud, and some would cry, and they might have all kinds of beads or various artifacts or little idols that they would raise up, this and that. You'd probably see the kids eating eggs. All over the city there would be eggs, decorating everything. There would be various other animal symbols, along with, you know, bunnies and so on. And you'd say, hey, I didn't know these ancient Babylonians were, were, were Christian. Why, this is hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked the earth. And here they are with Easter eggs and, and Easter rabbits. Well, the point I'm making is that the ancient societies of the pre-Christian world had some of the very same paraphernalia that you find perpetuated into so-called Christian Western religions of today. They did. They had the bunny. They had the rabbit. And some of the other famous Christian holidays had the very same accompanying paraphernalia, too, such as the Yule Log and bonfires, jack-o'-lanterns and witches' costumes and uh, exorc... How, how do they say exorcising, isn't it? Which is kind of like uh, a basketball game between witches where they get exorcised. No, I'm just kidding. But the exorcising of witches and the like, casting out of the demons and evil spirits, they did this type of thing back then. 
You'd be amazed if you could get in a time suit or a time machine and go back and visit ancient Greece, Rome, Babylon, Egypt, and find that they kept Easter. Now, you probably wouldn't see them saying anything at all about a resurrected Christ, but you'd see the eggs and the rabbits, you'd see the sunrise service, and you'd see the hot cross buns. Now, why do we perpetuate those things into a so-called Christian society? You write for this booklet, The Plain Truth About Easter. It'll blow your mind. No, no I'm just saying that to be kidding. It won't really. I think you'll enjoy it. It's uh, about 30 pages long. It has full-color illustrations. It is a brand-new booklet right off the press. It's uh, up to the moment. This booklet quotes the Catholic Encyclopedia. It quotes the Encyclopedia Americana, Britannica, etc. This is an historical thing, not necessarily just a religious thing. Remember, it's not a religious argument of mine. It's a... Uh, an historical document, you might say, a brief booklet that shows you the history of Easter, where we got the name that there was a pagan Babylonian goddess named Easter, pronounced Ashtar, Ishtar, whatever. Maybe the H was silent and it was Easter. I don't know just exactly what the inflection was because I don't speak very good Babylonian anymore. But uh, you can write for this booklet and you can find the truth about it. The plain truth about Easter. It's free of charge. There is no price for it. And also, while you're at it, be sure to write for the current number of the Plain Truth magazine. The Plain Truth is published in five languages, circulated around the world. More than two and a quarter million circulation, read by perhaps four to five million people. A family magazine dealing with the big issues, the big problems, the ones that confront us every single day. The food on your table, the shirt and the clothing on your back. Your own financial well-being, your job, your home, your school, your church, your family. Big issues of the day that are talked about by politicians, global pollution, crime, divorce some of the moral decadence in our countries and societies. Articles every single month along these and other lines and giving you the solution from the point of view of the Word of God. The Plain Truth magazine, free of charge, no price. And be sure to request the booklet, Just What Do You Mean? The Kingdom of God. Is the Kingdom of God something within you? Maybe somewhere along your religious experience you've heard someone say that. Maybe you even thought it was in the Bible. Did Jesus actually say to a group of carnal-minded Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you? There's a scripture in the Bible which people seem to think says that. You'll read of that in this booklet. This booklet goes through the scriptures on that subject and shows you, as no other booklet we have, exactly what is the kingdom of God. It is free of charge. There is no price for it. Just what do you mean the kingdom of God? So until next time, this is Garner Ted Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. You have been listening to The World Tomorrow. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.